everybody. Welcome to Westbrook Online. It's great to have you here today. I pray that you are experiencing God and that He is moving and working in your life. At Westbrook, we believe in four markers of a healthy disciple, worship, practices, action, and connection. It's our goal that everything that we do here would revolve around those four things. This summer, there's two things that I really want to highlight and bring to your attention today. One of those is the backpack and school supply drive. This summer, we're going to continue to bless our community and we're going to serve families in our area. We hope that you will partner with us and help us meet our goal of filling 100 backpacks with school supplies. These will go directly to the students of Irene King Elementary School. These items need to be brought to the church no later than July 25th. If you would like a full list of items or more information about how you can shop on our Amazon wish list, just visit our website, westbrook.church, or contact one of our leadership members. Another thing that I want to tell you about that's happening this summer is VBS. It's WOW 2021, the VBS experience. We are excited to announce this. We are excited to bring Vacation Bible School to you this summer. Mark your calendars and plan for your children and your friends ages 3 through completed 5th grade can attend. The dates are July 19 through 22. And it's from 6 to 7.45 p.m. It's at Westbrook. It will be a week that's filled with worship, lessons, games, and crafts. If you'd like more information or would like to register, you can visit our website, westbrook.church. I want to thank you for partnering with us in ministry. Uh, I'm sure by now that you've heard about the church merge with Crossroads. Your gifts are now funding both of these church sites. We also do outreach and ministry efforts like the Backpack and School Supply Drive, and we believe that giving is an act of worship that God calls us to. So I encourage you to give as you feel led today. Let me pray for us as we get started today. Lord, thank you for another Sunday, another time to join together and worship. God, we thank you for this online platform that we can reach people who aren't able to be here in person. Lord, I pray that everyone who sees this and hears this would experience your presence. God, that you would be moving, that your Holy Spirit would be speaking to us and guiding us in all that we do. And it's in Jesus' name, amen. Hey everybody, would you stand and worship with us today? Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. All you sinners, come find His mercy. Come to the table, He will satisfy. Taste of His goodness, find what you're looking for.
praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love. Praise God. In March of 2020, we were given stay-at-home orders due to the COVID-19 outbreak. I don't need to remind you of all of this. I don't mean to bring up such a bad memory, but I remember those moments of feeling a sense of hopelessness. We didn't know what was next, and I remember just hoping for some form of good news in the midst of everything, watching, watching the news and hoping that there was some form of a good story. In the midst of that, John Krasinski, who is an actor from The Office, he released a YouTube series called Some Good News. It's pretty basic in its format, and it was a series of videos that were good news, and it was also a series of interviews where they were lighthearted and fun, and he was just trying to keep people happy and giving them some good information during that time that we didn't know what was happening. It always cheered me up during those during those times, and and uh, it wasn't an escape from reality as much as it was a reminder that there were still some good things that were happening in the world, despite it seeming like nothing good was happening. I don't want to bring up all the emotions of that period, but I do want to remind us this, that we can all relate with this idea of needing some form of good news of any kind. We can all relate with that feeling of hopelessness and needing something to help us get along. Even right now, we are still probably limping along a bit and needing some good news as we are in this in-between time, not knowing exactly what the next few months are going to hold, but hopeful that things are going to move forward. We still long for this good news in our lives. A couple of weeks ago, I was watching The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, and and he finally had an audience of 400 people, a live audience of 400 people unmasked and vaccinated sitting in the theater. It just seems like there was some hope that things were starting to turn around. Christ came in the midst of a tiered Roman rule of the land. There would have still been Jewish leaders, but they would have had to answer to the Roman rulers at that time. Stories would have been told of the exile and and what that meant for their faith, for his ancestors. Governments had failed them multiple times. There were differing viewpoints in Judaism at that time. Of the, um, Some wanted to overthrow the government like the Zealots. Others wanted to compromise with the government like the Sadducees. Some wanted to live separated from the government in a secluded manner like the Essenes. So not much has really changed from that time to now. We still kind of have these different camps of people. 
Most were focused on the prophecy that were t- was told in the Torah, the prophecy of the Lord coming and when was it going to happen. It's no coincidence that Mark opens up his gospel with those familiar words from Micah and Isaiah. He does it to connect people to what they would have heard and what they would have expected the Lord's coming, the Messiah who would establish the kingdom of God. So if you have your Bibles with you, you can go ahead and turn to Mark 1, verses 1 through 15. Mark's gospel is short and concise. It focuses on the good news. Most believe that Mark is the first gospel that we have recorded. It's not focused on the history of Christ as much as it's focused on the message of Jesus. There isn't a birth narrative or anything about the history of his lineage. The earliest manuscripts actually have an ending with Mary Magdalene, his mother, and Salome going to the empty tomb and being told by an angel that Christ is risen. And that's it. That's how it ends with the women walking away. Other manuscripts have concluded it and added some um, different, had an appearance by Christ. But these things make it clear that Mark has a singular purpose with the telling of Jesus. Gospel. Commentator Lamar Williamson Jr. writes this. He says, the purpose of Mark's gospel is to bear witness to Jesus Christ as proclaimer and embodiment of the kingdom of God and to challenge readers to follow him in anticipation of his final coming as the son of man. So with that purpose in mind, let's start Mark 1, verses 1 through 15. This is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. So Mark is the only gospel that actually gives itself a title. It's the only gospel that says straight out that this is the gospel, this is good news. It's a reminder to his reader that everything that follows along in this gospel is good news about the kingdom of God. It continues, it began just as the prophet Isaiah had written, look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you and he will prepare your way. He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord's coming, clear the road for him. This messenger was John the Baptist. He was in the wilderness and preached that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. All of Judea, including the people of Jerusalem, went out to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. His clothes were woven from coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. For food, he ate locusts and honey. John announced, someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not even worthy to stoop down like a slave and untie the straps of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit." This scene with John the Baptist is actually meant to invoke excitement in the reader. It reminds the reader of what was written in the Old Testament, the Torah, what they had known, and say that this John the Baptist is the messenger that was told, about, told to us at that time, and now he's announcing the Lord's coming. The people who were waiting, John was saying that the wait was over. And this is what Mark is wanting to get across, that the wait is over. The wait, the time has come. This is good news. Things were about to change. One day, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, and John baptized him in the Jordan River. As Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the heavens splitting apart, and the Holy Spirit descending on Jesus, on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, you are dearly loved son, and you bring me great joy. So this is actually still within the prologue of the story that Mark is going to lay out of Jesus' ministry. He's baptized, and there is this bizarre scene of of having splitting apart, language that foreshadows the splitting apart of the curtain um, and the temple curtain upon Jesus' death. To the Jews, this made sense. It wasn't that that heaven was some far-off place in the sky. It wasn't like that at all. It was more of like a matrix-like experience where they're able to see beyond the reality that they could see in front of them. But Mark's gospel story places the emphasis solely on Jesus seeing these things and hearing these things. I like how commentator Lamar Williamson Jr. says that in this moment, Jesus is who God says he is. Ultimately, Williamson goes on to write that says that this is the same identity that we all receive upon baptism. We are God's dearly loved son or daughter, and we bring him great joy. And that identity is revealed through our life, death, and resurrection in Christ. The passage ends like this. The Spirit then compelled Jesus to go into the wilderness where he was tempted by Satan for 40 days. He was out among the wild animals, and angels took care of him. 
Later on, after John was arrested, Jesus went into Galilee where he preached the good news, where he preached God's good news. The time promised by God has come at last, he announced, the kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe in the good news. Again, Mark's gospel is pretty much to the point. It's, it's all talking about the message of Christ. And so there's a lot of things that are left out. And Matthew and Luke's gospel has a longer account of the temptation, but not Mark's gospel. We get to where John is arrested and, and the time of the prophet is over and the time of the Messiah is now. From here in a literary fashion, we move from prologue to the story, to the beginning of the story. Mark sets up his gospel by connecting the Old Testament prophecy to the good news of John the Baptist and then to Jesus. Then moves it to Jesus saying, the kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. Repentance is a touchy word. We don't like to publicly think of repentance. We believe in private repentance. Public repentance is reserved for those who are public figures. But just as John the Baptist preached for them to repent, now Jesus is saying the same thing, to repent and believe the good news. The kingdom of God is here and now is the time to repent and believe the good news about what the kingdom is. This series is called Upside Down because everything about the kingdom of God is upside down compared to what they knew back then and even what many of us believe today. Jesus didn't fit any particular camp in Judaism. As I said a couple of weeks ago, Jesus frequently told parables to describe the kingdom of God because it was a way for them to understand what it was. It was different than anything they had imagined. This call by Christ to repent of your sins and believe the good news is something that should probably be practiced daily. If we are to understand the good news of the kingdom of God, repentance is necessary. But what is this repentance? Is it only of sins? Repentance goes far deeper than repentance of sins, though. N.T. Wright says this about the passage. Of course, Jesus wanted people to stop sinning. But repentance for him meant two different things as well. First, it meant turning away from the social and political agendas which were driving Israel into a crazy, ruinous war. Second, it meant calling Israel to turn back to a true loyalty to Yahweh, their God. And does anyone with a smattering of knowledge of the Bible would recognize this was what had to happen before God would redeem Israel at last? The call to repent is part of the announcement that this is the time for the great moment of freedom, of God's rescue. That's why it goes with the call to believe Jesus' contemporaries trusted all sorts of things. Their ancestry, their land, their temple, their laws, even their God, provided that this God did what they expected him to. Jesus was now calling them to trust the good news that their God was doing something new. This is why I believe that repentance is a daily thing that we must practice in order to trust the good news. When I went to Bible college in 2006, I was a mess. Not emotionally, but more theologically, I was all over the place. I thought Bible college would be a sort of like CIY, nonstop sort of thing. And when I first started, I thought that I had a pretty decent understanding of Scripture. I mean, I was raised in the church, and I had been to so many church camps that I could tell you the right mixture of lighting, songs, sounds, and words that would trigger everyone to cry. When entering into Bible college, one of the things required for the accreditation of the university is a test that you take when you get in there. And it's it's a basic Bible knowledge test. And I don't remember a lot of the test, but I do remember one question of the test. And it was, in what book did the story of Joseph and his um, multicolored coat take place? I thought I knew the answer, so I wrote Exodus. Yeah. That's about as much as I knew of the Bible back then to where I thought that that was taking place in Exodus. So to say that I was startled when I took my Pentateuch class and found out as we were ending Genesis and coming along the story of Joseph, I wasn't just startled, I was humbled because I realized that I didn't know as much as I thought that I knew. 
But back then, I did think that I knew that. I even remember one of my first classes was called Basic Christian Beliefs. And I thought, you know, this is going to be pretty easy because basic is in the title. How difficult can it be if basic is in the title? And one of the books assigned to us was a book called First Theology, God, Scripture, and Hermeneutics by Kevin Van Hooser. I thought it was going to be basic. Let me read for you a little bit of the selection of the preface of the book found on Amazon. This is a book of theological hermeneutics. It is a plea for being hermeneutical about theology and for being theological about hermeneutics. It is an argument for treating the questions of God, Scripture, and hermeneutics as one problem. This one problem defines what I call first theology. So if you're like me, you're probably wondering, where's the basic part of that whole preface there? And my first year then taught me that I was a little, I, I, was, I needed to humble myself a little bit because I needed a dictionary just to get through the preface of that book. Needless to say, my thoughts and beliefs began to change throughout my time there in the next four years, and I began to learn more. But I still look back on those years and laugh because by the time I graduated, I thought that, okay, I'm at the place now where uh, now I'm certain that I believe what I should believe. Uh, Recently, a professor that I dearly loved and stayed in contact with throughout my time after college, he, he died. And in my senior year, I had to take one of his classes called Homiletics 3. And in that class, we had to put together a preaching calendar. Now, Johnson still operated with this idea that churches have Sunday morning, Sunday evening, and Wednesday evening church services. And so I had to basically come up with 156 different kinds of sermons and series. And I didn't have to have like the whole sermon written, but I had to come up with like a theme, a text, an idea, an outline of it, a title, a a series thing. Um, But as I was looking through my preaching calendar that I submitted for him, I noticed in the in the margin of one of them that he had said that the series over my gospel of Luke that I was doing, that it was a little bit too long and I might want to break it up a bit. And I laughed. And anyone that was a student when I was the student pastor here is probably laughing too because I did the series over the gospel of Luke with the students and it took a little over two years to do that series. So I made it longer instead of making it shorter. I'll stand by that series for now, but maybe I'll change my mind later. It's made me laugh because most of my life has been, I thought I knew enough only to be humbled by that thought later on in life, which is why I believe in practicing daily repentance and believing the good news. Because this daily repentance encompasses thoughts, beliefs, ideologies that we think are true, but then we learn that there may be more to it than what we originally believed. It's why I often pray that God forgives me for for the things that I thought I got right. Many of us are reluctant to change, which is why we may be reluctant to repent. We don't like admitting our failures. We don't like admitting our mistakes. And most of all, we don't like admitting that we may be wrong about something that we thought we got right. But Jesus says right at the beginning, Repent of your sins and of your thoughts and your beliefs and your ideologies and everything that you thought and believe this good news that I'm about ready to show you. Not just tell you, but show you. To believe in the good news of God's kingdom requires humble repentance. It is not just about sins as outlined in the Ten Commandments and throughout Scripture. It's a repentance of the mind because we constantly have to recognize that we may have been wrong which is why we have to lean into God more and more. This is most certainly antithetical to how our culture currently operates. We like to boast in expertise, but God's kingdom demands that we humbly repent and believe, to confess that we might have been wrong. This is why every single time I preach a sermon, it takes hours and hours and hours of prayer and meditation and study and rewrites because I want to make sure that what is coming out of my mouth are words from God and not from myself. It's why I quote N.T. Wright all the time, and you can make fun of me all you want about that, but I don't only read his commentaries, I also read other commentaries to help shine a light on the culture, on the language translations, on history and context, so that I'm not preaching what I want to believe, but preaching what I prayerfully considered to be from God. 
And don't mistake my words for God's words, but test them as we are told to do so as well. So when we say God's kingdom is upside down, it's because we have to repent and believe. Look at me when I say this. We all have to repent and believe. We all have to repent for our wrong thoughts, beliefs, and behaviors, every single one. No one is exempt. And then believe this good news of the gospel, that the kingdom of God is what Christ said it is. Maybe it's hard for us to believe this or to understand it because we, we haven't repented. Just as 2020 taught us that we all need some good news, so we are reminded today that we need good news, but we have to repent in order to hear it. I think a year of isolation has done damage to our repentance. When left alone, we aren't challenged in our beliefs. We aren't learning and growing with one another. When we disagree with something, we simply turn it off or we, we hide that post on Facebook. We unfollow that person on Twitter. We become more polarized in our beliefs because we don't have to meet the resistance to those beliefs. This is why I think small groups or mid-sized groups are vital to a Christian life because it demands that we look at one another in the eye and we grow together. We don't join because we're scared of commitment. Sorry, oftentimes we don't join because we are scared of commitment to change. We are comfortable with our current belief system and don't want anything to be challenged. The radical nature of this of God's kingdom might cost us more than we're willing to pay. Last week, Mont challenged you to read through the book of Mark, but I want to take it a step further and challenge you to read through the book of Mark, but read through it with a commentary and some friends. Read through it with a discussion of friends face to face and challenge one another in your beliefs. We have a Facebook group at Westbrook called What's Happening at Facebook. And earlier this year, or not too long ago, someone asked the question of what would be a good study Bible to have for her reading. These questions make me happy because it means that people are trying to grow. They're not just content with just reading through scripture, but they want to grow in their understanding of it. As we learn and grow, grow we repent for what we once believed and then believe the good news. The reality of the good news becomes even better because it is way better than what our limited view once was. We should be repent for that. We should be repenting for that. To believe in the good news of, the king, of God's kingdom requires humble repentance. Are you willing to humbly repent and believe? It doesn't matter if you've gone to church for a day, for a year, for your entire life. Are you willing to daily pray for repentance for the things that we thought we might have gotten right but ended up being wrong. I challenge you to grow in your understanding of the kingdom of God, but it's going to require repentance. Are we willing to humbly repent? In the Episcopal Church, one of the things they do that I love is to pray a corporate prayer of repentance, of confession before entering into a time of communion. As we partake of the sacrament, remembering all that Christ has done and has promised to do, we confess. It's not about being unsure as to whether or not Christ has forgiven us, but it's about knowing that we have already been forgiven and that we are confessing as a sign of humility, seeking to once again believe in the good news that was confirmed through Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. So as we move into communion, I want us all to pray this prayer together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen.
doesn't make 